You'll have noticed by now that I've got two props permanently on the studio desk. We've already talked about the chimps, monkey do what monkey see, in relation to soaking up the social conditioning influences. This is a basic and absolutely crucial point to understand that I'll keep hammering home in this series of films. And we also have this model of the human brain. So this film is all about how your brain works, habit and neural plasticity in particular. You can't talk about psychology and how to change a life without linking it to the physical organ which makes possible our ability to think and feel. We are our brain. It's the control centre of our body and of our life. It enables our highest dreams and ambitions, the ability to rationally think and calculate. It produces our feelings of love and empathy, as well as those disruptive self-doubts of insecurity the contradictions and hypocrisy, and much, much more. And yet most people know more about how to use the apps on their smartphone or how to cook a nice meal or two for friends and family or who should be selected to be in their favourite sports team than how the working of their brain links with their behaviour. It's bizarre. When people's lives are in turmoil or when they're living through the everyday drudgery of uninspiring normality, there's a vague acceptance of that's just how life is. There's little or no appreciation of freedom of choice, that change, even radical change, is a possibility. Yet if their smartphone was malfunctioning or lacking, they'd quickly get it fixed or replaced or search for a relevant app to help. Let's quickly think for a moment or two of the brain as our control centre. Can you imagine the chaos and carnage there'd be if the Flight Control Centre for Heathrow Airport, London, wasn't operating? Or perhaps was only partly staffed? Or managed by idiots constantly distracted and doing other things? Aircraft would be colliding, falling out of the sky, and those that survived certainly wouldn't be landing in the timely and orderly fashion that we've come to expect. It would be madness. I hope you're getting my point that not knowing yourself including how your brain works, isn't good. Selfishness is normalised chaos and carnage. So we need to correct this ridiculous oversight, at least in relation to the relevant bits that affect an individual's attempt at psychological change. OK, to understand the brain, we've got to go way back in time, hundreds of thousands of years ago, to the early days of Homo sapiens. Life then was very different to how it is now, with physical dangers lurking everywhere. You couldn't be an idiot. If you were, you'd soon be a dead idiot. Survival of the fittest was the key determining factor. Our brains are geared up for habit, which we'll look at in a bit more detail shortly. And this is basically a good thing. Historically, it helped keep us safe. It's still there, with us, even today. I'll give you an example. We have a huge nature reserve in South Africa, Comsberg Wilderness Nature Reserve. There are two species of extremely poisonous snakes, the Cape Cobra and the Puff Adder. These snakes can potentially kill you within a few hours if you're bitten, which none of us have been over the past 20 years, but the risk or danger is nevertheless real. Anyway, I've encountered a number of Cape Cobras and Puff Adders in my time at Comsberg, and when I'm back in the same spot where I've had a previous close encounter, my heart beats faster and I'm suddenly on high alert for a snake. This is an evolutionary warning device. We're geared up to remember a danger point, which can help keep us safe. So, a long, long time ago, when life was physically dangerous, with saber-toothed tigers and the like waiting to gobble us up for breakfast, lunch or supper, you couldn't mess around. Everything you did mattered. One slip up and you'd be toast, dead, either instantly or slowly as a result of injury, because this was well before hospitals and effective medical care. As the days, weeks and months passed, habits would form as complex neural pathways in the brain. These habits would vary from individual to individual, group to group, but the bottom line was that you couldn't be an idiot. 
We learnt from those around us how to keep safe so we could live without quickly becoming something's dinner or otherwise die prematurely. This form of social conditioning and how it impacted on our brain functioning was a good thing, allowing us to survive. We differed from other early hominids by having an open flexibility so we could rapidly react, adapt to any changing conditions, giving us a clear evolutionary advantage. This helped us to survive as a species and we eventually prospered. Part of what we learned to do was dominate the dangerous animals which threatened us. We eventually understood how to cure disease and to recover from accidents, as well as to prevent ill health through better sanitation and such like. So, fast forward to the present. There are no more saber-toothed tigers and tigers are rarely encountered in the wild, not least because we've converted most of the wild into farms, towns and cities, industrial estates, etc. This has left us free to walk more or less safely down the street or relax in our garden. The human brain is still much the same as before, but we can now be idiots and will likely survive. Some might even become popular idiots, with hundreds of thousands of other people soaking up their every word and action. Social conditioning is still a major factor on our behaviour. Monkey do what monkey see. Now, with idiots all around us, the biggest danger in this modern world is not that we'll be eaten by a dangerous animal or that we'll die a painful death after injury, but rather the real threat is that we'll also become an idiot within the wider society of idiocracy. We're back to Philip Larkin's poem. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. Evolution is a long-term process. What was once helpful to keep us physically safe is now somewhat irrelevant a lot of the time. It should now be a case of education to the rescue, as education should be the means of our present and future evolution. But teachers and lecturers are also idiots. We've become soft, snowflakes, largely ignorant to what we call the danger of easy. Complacency has set in. We've become a danger to ourselves, not just in the form of armed conflicts and any other form of aggression, but through being dumb. Psychological avoidance dulls and distracts us from facing the blunt reality of our unfortunate situation. We accept it, normalise it, doing little or nothing to challenge or change it. But our brain's capacity or tendency towards favouring habit is still very pertinent. And it should be seen as being a good thing, even when survival of the fittest isn't top of the list anymore. Habit saves us an enormous amount of time helping us to remember how to automatically do a range of everyday things without the need to relearn them every time. We function better because of habit, as it allows a wider degree of complex behaviour as a result. That all said, we're back to the issue of being able to be an idiot. Without the constraints of physical dangers effectively weeding out or eliminating stupid behaviour, the tendency to be sloppy, irrational, idiotic becomes an ongoing option and it's encouraged, widened by avoidance. You learn to make outrageous excuses, thinking you're getting away with it because most people will keep quiet and you can just as easily blame someone or something else, even when it should be blatantly obvious that it's you who's at fault. Laughter is a good thing, but it's been commonly hijacked to minimise and trivialise. Our brains develop sophisticated neural pathways consisting of myelin-insulated neurons. These connect different parts of the brain. Individuals who are serious about achieving their goal often use continual association between different aspects of what they do, thereby reinforcing their aim. They are, in effect, building a route in their brains to success. Research has also demonstrated that repeated practice is essential to deep learning and that it works by adding extra layers of myelin around the neurons. These additional, multiple coats of myelin enable better bandwidth and therefore greater performance. We become hardwired, to use a popular phrase. Our organisation has known, demonstrated, that you can change your psychology, your behaviour, for decades. This has now been confirmed by neuroscience. The process is called neural plasticity. It allows learning. 
it permits change. Individual connections within our brains are constantly being removed, weakened, or recreated, strengthened, largely dependent upon how they are used. To put it very simply, neurons that fire together wire together, and neurons that fire apart wire apart. But you have to be careful what you wish for. Habit is just habit. The choices you make are crucial because these determine the nature of the habits that you adopt and develop. So that's the good news, and it's very good news, of course. The bad news, which actually isn't really bad at all, is that you have to put in a lot more effort than is generally realised. This is because your brain is already hardwired for various habits. To create an alternative set of neural pathways, you have to practice and practice and practice a new form of behaviour before it's neurologically established. Meanwhile, you can't keep reinforcing the old habits or behaviour. They need to be weakened, replaced. You need to be deliberate, specific, persistent. And if your aim is to achieve excellence, then you'll have to put in a huge amount of consistent effort. To repeat, it's practice, 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 grasping every opportunity and working hard. You have to be intelligent when looking at your various habits. You can easily limit yourself without necessarily realising what you're doing. Past conditioning, how you've reacted to certain emotional situations in particular, will have formed habits that you accept as normal, but they'll limit or frustrate any progress. There'll be contradictions, opposing behavioural patterns that you'll need to sort out. Conditioning is most often a tangled mess of inconsistent and conflicting messages. Again, the saber-toothed tigers are nowadays absent, so you can very easily become an idiot without necessarily realising it. We've coined the term the bra strap effect. You try to change yourself in some way, which is like pulling or stretching the elasticated bra strap. But then you ease off putting effort into making the new behaviour and, bing, the bra strap is back to where it started. No beneficial change has been accomplished because habit has done what habit was intended to do. It snapped back to the norm for the purpose of maintaining routine. So, please, don't underestimate how much effort is required to change how you are, to change the neurological structures in your brain. There's a big problem with the brain in our modern world. It evolved, it wasn't designed. We've already looked at the need to grapple with habit, now made worse as most people around us are acting like idiots. Because ultimately, habit is a good thing. It's just the choice of these habits which needs careful scrutiny and an understanding about the amount of effort that's required to change them and create new ones. In terms of evolution, some bits of the brain are older, with newer bits bolted on. Although we should also see this as a process of overall development and increasing complexity. As neuroscience learns more and more, nothing about the human brain is simple or straightforward. What I'm attempting to communicate here is that the brain has evolved, rather than being specifically designed to make it completely fit for purpose at any one stage of our history. As the brain has developed in this way, through evolution, there'll inevitably be flaws. An older part of the brain is commonly called the limbic system, located below the cerebral cortex. Consisting of a number of structures, including the hippocampus and amygdala, it's responsible for producing the emotions of fear and anxiety, as well as helping with the formation of long-term memories. It gave us an essential evolutionary advantage when we faced real peril on a daily basis, when instant flight from danger was required for our survival. Nowadays, in our modern world, our evolved not designed brain can easily misread or unhelpfully react to a situation that involves us taking healthy, noble risks. Whereas these choices do threaten the status quo of normality, they're actually not dangerous. Indeed, they're a good or even great choice of direction. But our brain doesn't initially know this. We can suddenly be flooded with emotion at times of trying to be different. This emotional surge can halt us in our tracks, throw us off course, deter us from going forwards, 
especially if we don't know what's going on or when we're new at attempting to change. It can result in missing out on a golden opportunity. The brain's intention is to keep us safe by warning that there's a risk of danger. But uncertainty nowadays is a necessary part of healthy change. This emotional flooding is such an important topic that we've decided to dedicate a whole film to look at it. We've introduced the subject here because it's very much part of how your brain works. So, I won't go any further now, but I'll hopefully see you again very soon for film number 12 in this series.